So I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is James Briarton. I'm the executive producer here at WCNC Charlotte for weather and digital coverage. Uh, and Chris Colbert, uh, their Eclipse project manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Chris. This is the control room we used uh, to stream coverage of the Artemis One launch. So it's very, very cool good. for me to sit here now and talk with you there at Johnson Space Center for today's Intuitive Machines uh, 1M I am one landing, and let me ask you this, what is this mission all about? So a couple of key things. One, um, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program is trying to establish a different way of getting to the moon. We're utilizing commercial companies rather than NASA building the lander and owning the mission. So these are commercial missions delivering NASA instruments to the moon. So that's one key difference. The other, of course, is this is helping prepare for our future missions to the moon when the Artemis programs take humans back to the moon. These are the predecessors that help us learn about the moon and gather data that we'll need to get let humans work and live on the moon long term. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. How does this mission help that future Artemis project to get those astronauts back to the moon? What is this stepping stone doing? So um, one example, we're going to the South Pole with humans next time. So this mission is also going to the South Pole. We've never sent uh, anything from NASA to the South Pole before. Actually, the South Pole is largely unexplored by anybody. So we'll be having data about the radiation environment, about lighting conditions, about communication connectivity. All of that will be new. This mission gives us a chance to test all that before we send humans there. We can also gather data about the dust environment and things that will be unique, maybe potentially unique to the South Pole. Um, Chris, you mentioned that this is being done through a private company, uh, which is something we're seeing more and more of these days, where a government agency like NASA is partnering with a private company. What opportunities does that type of relationship open up for NASA when trying to conduct these missions? So first and foremost, um, it lets the commercial entity um, create a framework for more than government business. So intuitive machines will have a handful of commercial payloads in addition to the NASA instruments on this mission. So they're raising revenue from sources other than NASA, which lowers the cost for NASA. We're not paying the full cost of the mission now. We're just paying for a portion of the mission, which is good for us in the long run. It also allows the creation of this lunar economy, we call it, the opportunity for businesses to make money by providing services at the moon. NASA will be a big partner in that, or a big customer, if you will. We'll be one of the big early ones. But long term, we hope that we're just one of many customers so that the, the business of the moon is more than just what NASA wants to do. It's, it's broadening the economy to an environment where American companies can help participate, make revenue off of things beyond the government. Let me piggyback off that thought of uh, what this future vision in space looks like as we are moving into this next chapter with the moon and with Mars. Why is human spaceflight important? And how would you encourage someone who's trying to get on board uh, to explain to them what this next chapter is all about? Oh my, okay. Um, so I, you know, I would argue this is part of the, just this, this is human nature. We explore, humans are explorers. Um, in the long term, there's real benefits to us as a, as a society, as a race, to be able to exploit resources from a broader environment. If we can get metals and do mining on the moon or Mars, for example, uh, that might reduce some of the, the problems we have on Earth. But longer term, we also need more places to live. Elon Musk has talked many times about being a multi-planet species. Um, so that if something goes wrong with one planet, the species continues. I, I believe in all of those things. But you have to start with the early exploration process, and that's part of what NASA is for. My understanding of today's context is we could see something play out today that we haven't seen since 1972, a U.S. built spacecraft landing on the surface of the moon. Uh, I had the opportunity to read your bio. You worked uh, on space shuttle programs and have been with NASA here in a storied career. So I'm curious to get your take, Chris. How does today's mission, how does it make you feel with the perspective and the lens of your career? You know, this is really exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm really proud of the people at Intuitive Machines. They're wonderful. They're extraordinarily innovative, really, really clever. Um, it's a huge highlight for them, but for anybody who's worked for NASA as long as I have, this is the third program I've worked in at NASA that's trying to land on the moon, right? Uh, this one has a pretty good chance. I think we're gonna do it. Um, now, landing on the moon is hard, I get it, but but yeah, this is really exciting for anybody who's worked for NASA. I, I'm one of those people that, you know, I got to saw, watch Apollo 11 land when I was a kid. 
you know, that, that obviously influenced my whole life. So getting a chance to participate in an actual landing on the moon as a part of my career, that, that's a big highlight. I appreciate you sharing that uh, also very much. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, how today's mission goes and what comes with Artemis. Let me uh, maybe try to end on this thought. You mentioned that this is hard. It's the 21st century. It's been a long time since the Apollo program, but it still remains hard, doesn't it, Chris? How would you convey that difficulty to somebody? Uh, you know, one way, you know, if they land successfully this afternoon, they will be the first entity you ever landed the robotic mission successfully the first time they tried. We've had more failed missions to the moon than successful missions to the moon. Well, that's not just the United States, that's across the entire world. So it is hard. It, it, there's a lot of things that have to go right to complete a mission to the moon. Um, really, any mission in space, everything has to go right. Failures, are, even small failures, are, are really you know, quickly doomed the mission. Um, but we think they've taken adequate precautions. They've made smart choices about how they're getting there. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's hard. You know, we, we created the CLITS program with the idea that we were accepting more risk, that there might be a little more failures than traditionally for NASA. But NASA's success comes at a very high cost. This mission is costing less than $100 million. Um, by by the, you know, the standards of Apollo, that's dirt cheap. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, can they succeed while spending a whole lot less money but taking advantage of modern technology? That's, that's, the, that's the gamble we're playing with right now. I think they got a good chance. You mentioned the um, failures that have occurred. How would you as a project manager motivate in the event of a failure why is it important, do you feel, to try again or to move on to the next objective and, and pick up from that failure? You know, at, you know, NASA's famous for a failure is not an option phrase, right? But the truth is you learn a lot more from failure than you do from success. So, you know, when you fail a mission, you, you know, if you've got smart people who are paying attention and learn what they can, your chances of succeeding next time are way higher just because of what you learn. So, yeah, we really, we're really counting on that. Um, even if there are failures here, we've already chartered multiple missions to the moon. Um, part of our strategy from NASA was that we've already we've 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 contracted eight actually now I think we're up to nine different landings on the moon over the next three years. So even if there's some failures, we're counting on the fact that the companies will learn something, and they have a better chance of succeeding the next time they get to try. Chris, I know you got a lot of people to talk to today. We appreciate you taking time out to talk with us here at WCNC Charlotte. Wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.